but the funny thing is that um it's it's like almost reliable that the deepest things that we read and engage in are often things that people ignore like uh anim's miros at the end like people know about it because kids sing it but right. but uh, like the Vilna Gaon said, it's amongst the deepest things that we say. And it's ironic that it ends up that children are the ones who read it. But it's also, there's another one, which is a, a similar kind of poetry about God. And it's like very deep, very, very, very deep. And you yeah. can tell even if, if we read it, but it's done in such a way that almost guarantees that it's not taken seriously as a text. And this, on Shua's morning, the deepest Haftorah that we read, which is the first chapter of Yechezkel, which is the uh, chariot vision, yeah, which is considered a foundation text for a huge part of Kabbalah. Yeah. So it's read on Shavuos morning when people are almost by design too exhausted and therefore fall asleep because during they've it. Been studying all night. Right. right. So it ends up that people fall asleep for that half Torah as well. Yeah. And it seems almost by uh, design that some of the deepest texts that we have are yeah. snuck in to places where what, the vast majority wouldn't even know so that it's what, happening. What we have to do is just get into that subconscious, subconsciously, you know, just let it seep in. Maybe that's it. Maybe when you're in, I've jokingly heard people say that when they're teaching, if somebody falls asleep, they actually are encouraged because the mind is extra receptive as you're falling asleep. Right. So in some ways, that is a better state for a person to be in if you want them to absorb it than if they're actually wide awake and staring at you. Yes, with their mind wandering to 27 different places. Yes. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. Good morning. You must be talking about Akdat Muth. The Akdat yeah. Muth. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, Liz was talking about. Finding right. She thing. told me she read it because she asked her son about it. And, and he told her where to find it. But first he yeah. said, Corey, in Shul, everybody's asleep while it's being read. <laughs> yes. And that's why nobody's heard of it. Actually, the first, maybe the only time I heard it, Rabbi Stern at B'nai Amuna ages ago when we actually did stay up <laughs> and wait for it, he did it beautiful was it him or the cantor strip anyway it was beautiful it, 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 it was like hypnotic or maybe because i was sleepy okay <laughs> no it is it has a that tune when i was in sixth grade we had a teacher rabbi eichler his name was and uh he was this israeli gentleman who came to America and somehow, you know, somehow, like sometimes you have people, they come at a certain stage of life, but it's also part of their character that they're, that they are so defined already that, so like he came to America as who he was and part of who he was is this Israeli gentleman who is in some way sort of like an outsider, like an alien drop from another planet <laughs> in America. And uh, so he came to our day school and he 
for, I don't remember how many years he taught there, but I think I, we were in his first year. And it was also like even his teaching style was from another era. It was very much about um, disciplined study. <clears throat> so there were you did things every day and you made sure to do them and you did them in the same order. Um, scheduled. Like very scheduled, scheduled but and also like the... It, it was sort of thought out, but once you were, it was a lot of it relied on um, disciplined attachment to the study. So, so the fact that it wasn't just that he couldn't veer from something un, that was scheduled, but also he felt that you, uh, that doing it every day that itself is part of the absorbing process part of the learning process but you know we were not used to that kind of thing and also um, it was almost like rote study it wasn't necessarily a thoughtful questioning study it was like rote study um, which also when you're doing that on a schedule and you can't veer from it. I don't it has this kind of reaction for American young American students yeah. who are not used to that. So anyways, he had a lot to put up with. Um when it came to that, there were a lot of students who absolutely hated him for his <laughs> you know whatever. Um at one point he told my father you know, he's a young teacher in America, yeah. but his plan was he was going to be a businessman and make lots of money. That's ah. what he told my father, which was a very funny thing to think about when you saw him. It just didn't, I don't know. It didn't add up. <laughs> and then he, he moved to New York and he started this bookstore, which became this magnificent Jewish yeah. bookstore called Eichler's. And there, yeah, there's, a, there's a couple branches. And even to this day, if you want to reliably find a, a Torah book or Hebrew book. Uh, they are the go-to people. They're very, they, they're reliable. You just call their number or you order online. It's very reliable. It arrives. They always have things in stock. And uh, so he really did, I mean, he passed away, but he really did sort <laughs> of achieve. He, he was a successful businessman yep. in the end when he did that. Anyways, we're in sixth grade, and he taught us to read Akdamos ah. with that tomb, with the tomb, um, which oh. was a sort of traditional tomb. And so imagine, it's Aramaic. It's not even easy Aramaic. We're just in his class, I think, was the first time we had ever learned Gemara at all. Wow. And uh, so this is, it's not easy Aramaic. Uh, and it's Aramaic, and he taught it to us, and we got to the point where we could do it. We wow. could do it well. But then, when he contacted the shoals to tell them that he had prepared kids to do it, they told him that the custom is that the rabbi of the shul does it, not kids. So they didn't. So we didn't get to actually do it yeah. after all that work, and it was it was. A blow to him. So years later, I became the sort of acting rabbi of Darche Noam, and I started to do Akadamos. Ah. And I still do it from what I learned. In other words, I know it because yeah. in sixth grade, because of the way we had done it. it, and I do the tune that he taught us to do. That's so, great. I know. I've done it for like the last. Uh, you mean now I, don't I have know, to 15 go to years? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just for me. It only means something to me. Everybody else's like reaction. Everybody else's reaction is, "What is this?" Oh yeah, I vaguely remember we've done this before, and it and it goes on because it's not a short poem. No. And imagine somebody you're doing it two lines, then the con congregation, congregation says two lines, doing two lines, and it doesn't really in content. It's uh, it it's 
it, it, there's a variety of topics and they're right. very starting with Bereshi, we've got it right but, but and then ends up with the leviathan and the behemoth you know doing battle right. so it, the imagery is tremendously rich and it's beautiful poetry but when you listen to it it just looks like you're saying something over and over and over again because it always ends with the same note yeah. either saw almost always saw but sometimes taught da 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 and so after a while it just sounds like you're saying the same line ah, over and over and over yeah. again and it goes on for a long time so it it's just funny and the and i think you've touched or moshe touched on it that it's this thing i when i was reading the history of it it was taken out of the the British liturgy. It, it was the reform and cons, the reform movement took it out a long time ago. The conservative movement mostly took it out, but not officially. I think there's some places that might still do something with it. But the at, it, within the Orthodox world, first of all, only Ashkenazim do it. Sephardim don't do it, and uh, and so they were talking about in the a, the Brit at like around 1900, somewhere around 1900, the it was a decision of the British community just to take it out of the Sidur. They said it's, and, and the language was not pretty, you know, when they talked about why, why? Because nobody understands what it's talking about. It's in Aramaic. And, nobody, and even when you read the translation, who knows what it's talking about? So they actually took it out. I think they might, they, they said, there was even uh, a British sitter that Jonathan Sachs translated, which had didn't have it in it. And then, then they said the latest one, the latest version, has it back in there. Arts Girl did a book about it. Give them credit. Well, it's still in there. <laughs> right. And uh, and it's in the you know, the Arts Girl. It has it, but Arts Girl had one of those standalone books that they used to do towards the beginning of their public of their publishing history. They used to do these <clears throat> one about the Shema, they did one about different subjects. So they did do one about Ectomos. Mainly I was looking for more about the behemoth. There's not <laughs> there's not there's not enough written about the behemoth. No, we have to find him. Somebody has to work on that and extend the whole behemoth thing. Right. I have to read this one line. I'm looking at the Schattenstein, the art scroll um, for uh, sort of for Sabbath and festivals. Yeah. And at the Octon Moose, this is the first line. Okay. Composed by Rabbi Mayer Ben Yitzhak, 11th century in Worms. Octavus may be Judaism's best known and most beloved. He you. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, that's who you want, you know, working on a commentary and translation. You want somebody with that uh, excited. Yeah. Also, right. it's funny about us that we are often characterized as the people of the book, people of letters. There are there are other cultures around the world that will talk about that, how we value education and the written word and the contributions we made to it. And then you find Jews just tossing poems out like, can we get rid of that poem? Why do we have to have that poem in our lives? Ah. Like if you look at a moxer and look at how many liturgical poems there are that nobody, we don't say them anymore. It's simple. Right. And the attitude that many of us have is really, you know, like, can I get home? I'm hungry. <laughs> yeah, I want to go home. I want to eat. So that reputation is not necessarily entirely well-deserved, at least when it comes to our poetry. And some of our greatest scholars during that Middle Ages period, from like 
the ten hundreds to like the fourteen fifteen hundreds spent a lot of times. Those songs that are at the end of the Haggadah. It's not Bob Dylan didn't write those songs. You know, they were written by scholars who took pride in being able to convey like those kind of ideas and poetry. Yep. It's funny, just just completely no longer in vogue. Um all right, so last time uh, we were sort of mapping out the the actual swallowing up of the Korach family oh, right. and followers. Um, and there were some left out bits. It's not it's not entirely clear from the text how it all works. Where was everybody at each moment here? But we try, you know, try to do some work on it to figure out. So one of the things was that there were these 250 people with fire pans. And fire pans means a flat pan that's made to have hot coals in it with incense burning on top. So the, the purpose of these is to hold incense. Right. And, right. So, and it seems from the text, like this is what Narav and Avihu had done at the um, inauguration of the altar and the and the, and the Mishkan, this is what they had done that caused their death, that they had brought these kind of uh, fire pans with incense on them, but had, had not been instructed to do it. And because they had done it in an improper way, or maybe at an improper time, or maybe both uh, with the wrong intent, they they die. So now this very same service or very same process is going to be the test. And you have these 250 people um, who are going to essentially be doing what Nadav and Abihu did. And that is, is going to be a demonstration of the fact that they deserve to do this as much as anybody else. Um, I don't remember if we talked about this last time, but I know we talked about this when we were more focused on the role of the Levine early, earlier on. Um, we were talking, I remember we went into some depth about this what was the plan? In other words, when, when there were firstborn, and this is after the going out of Egypt. So the firstborn, we are told, because of the fact that God protects them from the destruction that's happening to the firstborns of the Egyptians, that God has to give them special protection, the Jewish firstborn. And the result of that protection is that they are somehow sacred now to service of God. And we're told that they would have been the ones who worked in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle, had it not been for the golden calf. Then the golden calf came and they are switched out for the tribe of Levi. That that's that that is explained in the Torah in various places, snippets here, snippets there. But that, and therefore there is something called pigeon aben, which is a redemption of the firstborn because the firstborn no. <coughs> were sacred and firstborn if it's a male. Firstborn male. So there is a they would have been. Uh, 
devoted to working in the Mishkan or divine service. Uh, so in order to resolve that, they are they are redeemed. There was a, a, a in this ceremony called Pidinabat. And um, now it's the Levine that are going to be the ones who are serving in the Mishkan. So when we talk about Korach, being upset, what is Korach upset about? It's not clear at first. There, there's, there, there seem to be two issues. But w one issue is Moshe's leadership and decision-making, and the other one is Aaron's position as Kohen Godel. And so the way it's usually presented in the commentaries is that he felt that he should have been the Kohen Godel, not Aaron, because yeah. he's also uh, he has the same kind of yichos that Moshe and Aaron do. He's, he's from Levi, same kind of generation as them. And, um, and so the way it's characterized is you already have one position of leadership. Now you're giving the other high position of leadership to your brother. It's nepotism. Right. Um, and so, and, and I, I should have been the one to get going to go but there's another way of looking at this. I'm just suggesting this myself, but I'm sure that somebody has gone here before, but, and that is that what, what do the Levine do? If, if you look at uh, the earlier Torah portions, the Levine's responsibilities were um, primarily when it came to moving the Mishkan. They're the, they're the ones who are actually moving the Mishkan and setting it up. Right? When the Mishkan is actually functioning, what do they do? Hmm. So when, when we look later in the Beis HaMikdash, they have two primary jobs. Primary job number one is they are the honorary guard. The pro so they stand at checkpoints and guard various entrances to the Beit HaMikdash. They are, so they're sort of like bee feeders, the honorary guard of the Beit HaMikdash. They are also the choir and the, you know, the symphony of the Beit HaMikdash because while offerings were brought, music and song accompanied it. That's it. They don't have a function when it comes to sacrifice. They don't, the Kohenim do everything to do with sacrifice. The Kohenim, from the time that the animal is brought, it's Kohenim who are taking care of it. Even the menial stuff is all done by Kohenim. Cleaning out the menorah, Kohenim. Sweeping the floor, Kohenim. There's not from the most menial to the most sublime, all the work is being done by Kohenim. They have no role in the actual service other than, I'm not saying it's nothing, but singing and, and, and accompanying with music that, that's their role when it comes to the service. They are not involved directly in the service of what goes on. And when you're reading about what their role will be, it seems like they're going to have that role, that they're going to be the ones, the tribe of Levi are going to be the ones that bring the korba. That they're going to be the ones who, uh, who are doing a lot of the work that the Kohenim are doing. So I'm suggesting, it, it's very, honestly, if you try to 
piece together all the details, sort of like what we're doing with Korah. Where was everybody when this stuff was going on? If you try to piece together that trade-off, like what was originally supposed to happen and what did happen, it is not easy. You have to look at it. The, the, the Even classic commentaries do not provide a clear understanding of what were they thinking the Bahor was going to do? What are they thinking the Levim were going to do? And did the Bahor ever do the work they're being spoken of? Did the Levim ever do the work they're being spoken of? Um, and so you do see, there are some people that talk about it, but it's usually contemporary and they pieced it together from different things. So I wanted to suggest that part of what is gutting Korah is that until the appointment of our own, the Levim were going to do all the service in the Mishkan. They're going to do all the service in the Mishkan. They're going to be the ones. Suddenly, this position of Kohen is presented, and it completely guts the value of being a Levi. There, um, somebody told me that for years they had this status on American it was called like premier status something like that so when if you got premier status you were allowed to board first right you got first upgrade opportunities um and all and all sorts of other perks so people worked hard to try to get premier status even wealthy people would like make sure that they had the right credit cards to get the right points and the right and that they flew enough miles in order to be able to get this status um and then so that that was that status existed for a few years and then suddenly they introduced a new status that was higher than Premier. So, and this person told me that she she remembers being waiting to board, and they called this new status, whatever it's called. And they got all the per essentially got all the perks that Premier used to get. Premier still exists. And they weren't being told you're losing any anything. Right. But suddenly this new status was created. With this new status, when you get on the plane, they greet you by name. Like when you're sitting in your seat, it's so good to see you, so Mrs. Good. Gora. Yeah. And, and should I get you your usual cocktail or something like that? That's like the kind of treatment you get at that thing. But you also got boarded first. And so there's some guy whispering behind her, what is the point of having premier status anymore? I don't, you know, like, because yeah. all the... All the perks the, moved up. Yeah, and the special, the prestige. Oh, I think that's what it's called, prestige. prestige that would make the sense. New one. Right, but all the prestige is, is sort of gutted from it. So I was thinking that this is, this. it's not just that Korach lost out of being coin Godel. Being a Levy got, imagine you're on the board of a giant company. Being on the board is a great honor and also great responsibility. Then you find out that they just created an executive board and the executive board is going to make all the real decisions. Right. right. So you're suddenly, you still on the board. You still have all this stuff, but now all the choice parts, all the, all the important parts are now being done by completely different people. Right. So then it wouldn't just be the coin gone over, but the whole coin Thing. And it does look inserted. Like if you look through everything, you're not prepared for the fact that suddenly Aaron and his sons are going to be doing X, Y, Z. You're just not prepared for it. It sounded like the Levim are going to be doing all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you're introduced to this notion, Aaron and his sons are going to be doing all this stuff and his descendants. And it, and it sort of cuts out the prestige and uh, of, of what it was to be a lady. Right. So um, you could see how that could gut somebody because it upset uh, him a little bit, right? Not not only is he not getting a choice position, but being a lady is no longer 
ask somebody who's a Cohen nowadays, and they'll tell you, you know, that there was a, a there's a, a sense of a kind of aristocratic pride <laughs> that they have. And there was a time in history where the Cohen were were a higher class. They you never hear that about Levine. The Levine mm -hmm. were not the higher class. The Levine are often associated with the poor. And the Levi, which is in your gate, the Torah will say something like that. Like, watch out for the coin and the Levi, which is in your gate. <laughs> and, um, so mm -hmm. obviously that wasn't necessarily uniform throughout history. The Rambam cites a third role that Levi had, which he believes was, you know, a, a hugely important part, which is because they are not farmers. They don't have to work the land. So they are able to be educated to a high degree, and therefore they became the teachers, the, the members of the Sanhedrin, the, um, and they played a very important role. Um, also, they, they represent a kind of pious devotion of God, where um, almost something more like a monk, like a monk in life, would, would represent somebody who's Lahabdil El goes, but the idea that you're you're devoted to God, relying on God to take care of you. But again, uh, and so there was a kind of sp a spiritual class that may have uh, been represented by the tribe of Levi, or at least symbolically represented by the tribe of Levi. But you could, yeah, uh, Rabbi Karsh, your interpretation of this is supported by what Moses answers. Korah, instead of responding about the whole community of Israel, he tells them. What the, Lechem bene Levi. Yeah, he tells yeah. them what the you know, Levi is, but you have this to do, you know. Right. But it's, you could see how they're looking at it going, don't, you gutted it. You gutted it. Yeah. No, I know, but I'm saying that yeah. Moses yeah. saw that right away. But yeah. I, I have a question. When is it the priesthood itself or, or the you know, that class, the ladies themselves. When was that picked? Is it because they were relatives of Moshe? I mean, why not another tribe? Why not Yuda? Why not? No, I mean, it's it says be, uh, because at the time, I mean, they may have, this may help to understand why they were, but they were united behind Moshe after the golden calf. Ah, uh, right, right. They right, responded. Right. To them. Now, you could say, why are they responding to Moshe? Because he's a tribe member. Uh huh. I I never thought of that. I I never thought of that. I but they are always credited for answering Moshe's call. Mila Hashem Eli, who is to God, you know, come to me or with me. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's that's uh, that's the moment. Whereas, so then the question is, where where were the firstborn? What were they doing? Why? They must have been doing, they must have been engaged for some reason uh, to a greater extent with the golden calf to such an extent that the firstborn are stained by their behavior with the golden calf and the tribe of Levi are promoted because of their um, steadfast support of, of Moshe. Uh, but I never thought of that. That's an interesting point you're making. That because, like with King David, initially as he's moving towards being king, he's anointed uh, originally privately by the prophet by Shmuel, uh, and it takes a while before he starts to take steps to actually live the kingship. And his first step is to be king over Yehuda. And, and Yehuda would naturally accept his kingship because he's from their tribe. Yeah. So that's interesting. So the descendants of Benjamin then would have, if, if you know, Shaul hadn't done what he did, the kings would descend from Benjamin? I mean... Right, I, that was a possibility. So that I mean, In theory, that's a possibility. Um, whether whether things were stacked against Saul in a way that wouldn't ever allow that to happen is another another possibility. Because huh. uh, Yehuda, already in the blessing to Yehuda, 
the tribe is told that the scepter will remain with Yehuda. And so somehow the tribe of Yehuda seems to be specially identified as the tribe of the kingship very early on. So if you, so it's hard to reconcile um, the potential that Shaul represents. Because let's say Shaul, we're assuming free will. And therefore, that means Shaul did not have to make the wrong decisions about God's command. If you assume free will, which we do, uh, and that means that Shaul could have chosen to follow through on the commands, then what would have what, what would have happened? Then he would have been continued to be the king. His children would follow in his footsteps. And again, with free will, let's assume everybody makes the right choices. His descendants do that for generations. Then that would seem to me that the kingship would stay with the house of Saul. When it comes to free will, people have all different ways of calculating things. <laughs> yeah, but I'm saying, let's, uh, let's assume the simple notion of free will, that everybody always has a choice. Um, so then it would have worked out that way. Uh, Ramosha Shapiro uh, once pointed out, bless my memory, once pointed out that there's the section in the book of Shmuel that talks about the battle with Amalek. So it's read as a Haftorah. It, it's read as a Haftorah on Parsha Zohar, I think. Uh, where we read about destroying Amalek. And so there's the Haftorah. <clears throat> and if you look in a Chumash, it'll say this. Sometimes this happens with Haftorah. It'll say Ashkenazim have a custom to start here. So if you look in the Chumashim, it'll say Ashkenazim. In, in the article ones, I think. It says Ashkenazim and Chabad have a custom to start here. Um, but Nusach Sfard, which is like the other Hasidim, start one line earlier. So Ramosha Shapiro suggested that the reason they start one line earlier is because in that previous line, it, uh, Shmuel says to Shaul, I'm the one who anointed you. I'm the one who anointed you. Um, I am the anointer. I'm the one who anointed you. So, um, and then later on in, uh, in that section of that Haftorah, Shaul is apologizing to Shmuel for not following through on the command exactly. And he, and he says, I transgressed the word of God and I transgressed your words. So Ramon Shapiro said, what does he mean? I transgress your words. He said, because if you look back at that line, what it means is that Shmuel was telling him, you can do this, even though the consequence of doing this would mean you are Mashiach, that you would be Mashiach if you did this. And he's saying to him, you can be Mashiach because I anointed you and the, the power to be Mashiach is through my anointing. That's what he's saying. So if I anointed you, you have the potential to be Mashiach. If you wipe out Amalek in the proper way, you will be Mashiach. And you and and so that suggests, and then but Shaul doesn't it, it, it suggests oh, we're still that, waiting. No, because because Shaul, this is part of the criticism of Shaul is that he doesn't believe in himself. He does it. It sort of goes back and forth, but he doesn't fully believe in himself. And this, so this is that notion that. Uh, Wouldn't that off that line maybe imply that Shmuel anointed him, but Hashem has not yet. Hashem was no, waiting for somebody no, else. No, no, because no, because he said here. What what is that? Line? Meow, 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 meow. 
ויאמר שמואל אל שאול, אותי שלח השם למשכך על המלך על עמו ישראל, ואתר שמע לכל דברי השם. So Shmuel says to Shaul, Hashem sent me to anoint you as king of the people over Israel. So okay, now, never mind. <laughs> yeah. Never mind. Right, so he's saying that embedded in this is, I was sent by Hashem lemoshachacha to make you, in other words, to anoint you, and in the anointing is this thing. And then later on, it is the potential to be Mashiach. And then later on, In verse 24, Saul says to Shmuel, I have sinned. I transgressed the, the word of God or the mouth of God and your words. So he's saying, what is the and your words? He was suggesting it was his assurance that you are you have the potential, you're qualified to do this. You, you, and, and it comes through the anointing. You know, that's why we call Mashiach, Mashiach. Mashiach, right. Well, that certainly does mean that free will plays, because if even Hashem anointed him, he, had, yeah. Right. So, <laughs> he had, I can have these free, you, you, in the discussion of free will, there are people that still want to allow for a certain amount of fate or determinism. So you can come up with all sorts of creative ways of doing it, which is you could offer a hundred people uh, free choices, but the, all 100 would have to make the right choice in order for something to work out. And what are the chances of that? And let's say you did a thousand people, a chain of a thousand people. So at some point, even though technically everybody has free will, you're you're creating a circumstance where there's a sort of faded outcome. Uh, there's a million ways of doing that, uh, like of, of trying to leave room for some faded outcome. So somebody could say, at the same time, we have free will, but it's also fated that the, that the, oh, the, has, right, the, the kings are eventually going to come from Yehuda. Um, and still they have free will. Or you could say, like some people say, which is you have free will for most things, but you don't have free will for everything. And that it's there are certain faded things that have to happen, and somehow there's going to be an intercession to make it happen. It's not just going to happen because of a chain of free will decisions that people made. That's an option. And then you have people like the Ishbitzer, who's very comfortable with with big things happening amongst the Jewish people, and saying nobody had free will over it. They didn't have free will. The Golden Calf. They didn't have free will. This thing they didn't have free will over there. Uh, David and Bacheva, he didn't have free will. So it was a, a kind of intervention. So, um, but that was considered very, very controversial during this time. Uh, to say something like that, and we've had our free will discussions on many occasions. But yeah, okay. So. We get back to the people, the 250 dying. Because uh, these are non Kohanim who are now performing this. So you have many strikes against them. One is they're performing a service that is not a regular service. Another one is they are non Kohanim performing this service. So it said in chapter 16, verse 35, and a fire went out from God and consumed the 250 people who were bringing the 
incense. See that? Yep. Okay, so now could you read the beginning of 17? So read until verse 6. Until Hashem, 6. Okay. Hashem spoke to Moses, saying, Say to Eleazar, son of Aaron the Cohen, and let him pick up the fire pans from amid the fire, and he should throw away the flame, for they have become holy. Don't call it that. As for the fire pans of these sinners against their souls, they shall make them hammered out sheets as a covering to the altar, for they offered them before Hashem to. So they became holy. They shall be for a sign to the children of Israel. Eleazar the Kohen took the copper fire pans that the consumed ones had offered and hammered them out as a covering to the altar as a reminder to the children of Israel, so that no alien who is not of the offspring of Aaron shall draw near to bring up the smoke of incense before Hashem, that he might be like Korach and his assembly, as Hashem spoke about him through Moses. Right. So it's interesting Korach is still evoked here because these 250 do not include Korach, because we saw Korach's with his family not right. holding incense pan for some reason. They got swallowed up. And they got swallowed up. So for some reason, Korach's not with the incense pan people. Unclear why, but he's not. The other interesting thing, and there's, I guess, quite a few, but another interesting thing is that these are called Kadosh. So which means that even though they are rebels, as it were, doing something that you're not supposed, to, they're not supposed to be doing, there is a sanctification that happens to those pants. So in verse two, Moshe is instructed to have Eleazar pick up the pants because they have been sanctified. And then they are pounded out, made into like a copper sheet that is, so the altar is, is gonna be called the copper altar uh, because it has these copper sheets around it. And these copper sheets are there, we're told, because they became sanctified in verse 3. They brought them before God and they became sanctified. Pause. If you look in the Hebrew for that word, Vayikidashu, there's like a wishbone underneath it. That's called an asnachta. That's like a either a comma or a semicolon. That's a pause. So they were so wh why are the being used as a kind of copper sheeting for the Mizbah, for the altar? Because they brought them close before God and they became sanctified. And then in the next segment is and they will be a sign for the people of Israel. They will be a sign for the people of Israel. But the first statement is, they are in fact holy. So whatever happened here, there was an offering. There was a sanctification. And the offering and sanctification have some effect. Because these became holy. Now you could say that before the whole process began, they technically just sanctified them. Right? They just said this is going to hereby be sanctified as a service utensil of the Mishkan. 
And that's how they did it. But it's not how it's presented. They present it as because they brought them close before God and sanctified them. That suggests that there is, I'm suggesting that it, it suggests that there is some kind of sincerity. There is some kind of sincerity in what's going on. They, they are, they are bringing this to God. They are not bringing it to idols. This is not a golden calf. This is not a golden calf moment. They are sincerely trying to serve God. And that has an impact. And then uh, it says that uh, he does in fact take them. They do it and they make it a cover for the altar. And then it says it is a reminder for the people of Israel. Now, this notion of being a reminder seems to harken back to the word oat. It will be an oat for the B'nai Israel, And the oat is a sign or some kind of. So message. So what is the sign and message? So that's what this seems to be that explaining that this is that that it is a reminder to the people of Israel that a stranger shall not bring forth who is not from the seed of Aaron to bring forth the incense before God. If so, and, and it says, and not be like Korach and Adoso, which uh, like, God, like God spoke to Moshe. Ka'asher diber Hashem, as God spoke Biad Moshe, lo, um, through Moshe to Korah. So, uh, my son, I, I had mentioned this to you earlier. I have no idea. I, I want you to know that I took comfort about 10 years ago. I was in Milwaukee and Rabbi Torsky was giving a Bar Torah. And he began the Bar Torah by saying, I have no idea if I talked about this with you yet. <laughs> yesterday. It's very possible that even yesterday I talked to you about this, but this is what I'm going to talk about. So I get a deeper and deeper sense of what he meant. But anyways, my son, Srili, one of the, one of the uh, things in my museum, uh, one of the exhibits in my museum of things you expect to find in the Torah, but do not, is you do not find a martyr, somebody who died for their belief in God or their support of God. You don't, you know, in the five books, you do not find a martyr. There isn't a midrash, you, you find them, but you do not find them in the text. You, 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 know, you don't find somebody who died because of their belief in God or their support of God. So I once brought this up, and my son Srili said, in a kind of out of the box way, Korah, maybe Korah is an example of somebody who died because of their belief or service of God. Now, at first blush, you want to dismiss that, but I, this wording here, because the reason I'm saying you want to dismiss it is because they are treated as just a self serving. Right. Uh, Re traitors, rebels. But this language in verse three, where it's it's it talks about the uh, it says Ki he krivum Hashem They brought them before God and were sanctified, and they are a sign for the people of Israel. The fact that those pans became sanctified, that they end up as the covering for the altar. There's two sides to it. On the one hand, it's a warning against strangers doing the service. But on the other hand, their pans are surrounding the altar. And the language suggests they, they did bring them close before God. In other words, it seems to suggest sincerity in their service. So... What at first seems outlandish that that Korah and his followers could be a model 
for uh, martyrdom, an example of martyrdom. When I brought that up, it actually bothered a kid. That when I was years ago, I was telling a kid with that Rabbi Tatz about my uh, museum, and uh, so when that one came up, when I was on the list, I was going through the list, and he stopped me when the martyr one comes up and goes, "That is interesting." Like that one, he was sitting on it for a while. Like, like. Uh, why isn't there? Because there should be for that. Um, so, because it's such a deeply important uh, aspect of serving God. Um, or, and, well, we call it Messiris Nefesh, haven't you, over your, your life for the service of God. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure he had other reasons why he thought that was interesting, not just that. But the um, yeah, so I'm thinking at verse 3 over there could be an indication that really is onto something. There's, there's more to that, what was going on there, that they sincerely perhaps believe that they should be doing this, that they could be doing this, and that they sincerely wanted to serve God. Well, Rashi says the, the two text two the two hundred and fifty men had sanctified the censers for use in their ill fated incense service which kind of says that they were doing it they thought for good purpose. Right. Again if you if you thought of them as self serving traitors, you may not catch the nuance. have to be open to the fact that they're not, that, they, that they're sincere. And this verse isn't even the whole notion that they've sanctified those hands, but especially this one, they brought them close before God. Um, eh, I'm hearing a little bit. I'm hearing some music. I'm hearing some music. Okay. Um, I am grateful for this opportunity to run with you guys. I look forward to doing this again. Thank you. Rabbi, Rabbi you want you want to call Abraham. Um, he was willing, in a way, to give up his whole future by sacrificing. You mean, uh, right, but is yes, that, I don't know. You could, I guess, try to go there, but ultimately isn't it different i mean some people would say it's worse than killing yourself or you know letting yourself be killed yes yes right so there's like a calva homer like a, a kind of calva homer <clears throat> not calva homer whatever uh, uh there's a different word for that that it's somehow subsumed in the willingness to sacrifice yitzchak so it is a kind of self-sacrifice that is interesting that is interesting Remember about the museum. It's not there to give answers. It's just there to inspire the exploration of the idea. What would be in the gift shop? You'd have oh, a little a little Yitzchak laying on a... Never mind. I don't want to think about it. Okay. Did you ever see... <laughs> I, when, I, when I've tried to... Uh, when I've tried to find it through Google, I have not been able to find it. One time I saw it. Then... A while later, I was searching for it, and I somehow find it again, but I, I don't know how to find it. But there's this comedy, like a little comedy troupe uh, that did sketches, an English comedy troupe. And they have one about Akeda Yitzchak, which is just hysterical, <laughs> absolutely hysterical. Um, so that is available in a good shot. Okay. Somehow okay. they get that, and uh, obviously the little um, Lego Leviathan or behemoths. <laughs> yeah, we right. got to track them down. <laughs> There's stuff. There's all sorts of fascinating stuff. Well, in a way, all those little icons with a sheep caught in the thicket, which they do have. Yes, they do. I saw. I saw it at a from Ur. 
I, I, I saw an uh, exhibition of artifacts that came from digs at, at, at Ur, a newsy Ur in Mesopotamia. And they have, uh, yeah, they have uh, rams in a thicket. And now they might call it rams in a thicket now because of the, of the Torah. I don't know what they originally called it, but they were some kind of ram-like figure. Yeah. Caught in a thicket. Caught in a bush. Caught in the bushes. Yeah, some kind of bush. Yeah, okay. yeah that, that, I, I think that is there. I don't remember. You know what's there that has nothing to do with any of the exhibits? Whenever I go to one of those, like the University to the Museum of Science and Industry and other ones, like the big museums, they used to have this wave machine. It was like it was glass. It was like a rectangular glass container yeah. that had some kind of water in it that was um, viscous. Like th there was a oh. viscous blue part, and then a white, and then a regular water. So it looked like it was. It looked like waves were like rolling and then crashing, and <laughs> waves were rolling and then crashing. I was like a little kid when I saw that, but man, I wanted that wave machine. I thought that was the coolest thing. <laughs> in the Museum of Science and Industry, they have some excuse for it, but in my museum, it's just there. Anybody who wants it, it they're not it's expensive. It's parting of the city. It's not that. Should we say that? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Actually, it's the part. What the sea looked like before it parted. Yeah. That's what it could be. All right, be well. Bye. Good Shabbos. Bye-bye. Good Shabbos, everybody. Well, we'll talk to you if you're still there. Yep. I will be around. Okay. Oh.